Hello, I'm Susan Nash with AAPG, and I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak today with Gilles Machado, who's with uh, Chrono Surveys. And Gilles, would you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure, thank you very much, Susan. Uh, so I'm a geologist by background, and I did my PhD on uh, stratigraphy, specifically biostratigraphy and petroleum geology. And I've been working in the industry for the past 10 years or so uh, as an explorationist and also as a biostratigrapher. And recently I've started a consulting company, Chrono Surveys, and we've been doing, uh, in addition to normal consulting work, also a bit of uh, research and development. And this today, Salt Biostratigraphy is one of those projects which is now matured and we're now I'm really fascinated by that, and I know that a lot of people who are working in um, various areas, regions with salt, will be fascinated by this. And so, we'd love for you to talk to us about salt biostratigraphy. Yes, absolutely. And thank you for the opportunity to talk about this. Indeed, I think one of the challenges now is to make the community aware that this is uh, possible, that it, we can extract. Uh, uh, reliable and relevant data from uh, evaporite deposits, which I think people don't really realize. So thank you for the opportunity to talk, to talk about this. So uh, maybe I can go th through the presentation and I'll present briefly what we've done. Great, that's wonderful. So it all started with the question if fossils can be preserved in evaporite, so in halides and hydride gypsum and other evaporitic sediments, and also in the sediments that occur uh, interbedded with these uh, sediments, so any salty shales and other uh, sediments that usually are interbedded with uh, evaporites. And the answer to that is that yes, they can. Um, they can be preserved and what we've done is to explore how we could extract those fossils from evaporitic sediments and that that was the main uh, uh, issue i think um, so this started with with some coal uh, some mine samples and i'll show you some uh, of the case studies that we've worked with and uh, what, what we've seen is that in mines usually uh, the halide if it contain if it's not pure halide so very white Pure halides, the the geologists at the mine call it impurities of that that halide contains, and that's exactly what we're looking for. These impurities, most of them will be just silts and, and clays, but some of them will also be uh, microfossils, notably organic microfossils. So in this um, cartoonish kind of uh, reconstruction of uh, an evaporitic environment, and this is from the current uh, day Dead Sea. There's a river in input and also um, uh, blown in by winds. You have cl clays and silts, but you also have spores and pollen of any vegetation that is um, surrounding the, the evaporitic lake or sea. If it's connected to the to the sea, to so with normal marine conditions, and you have if you have periodic invasion of seawater, then you can also have algae uh, and whatever uh, uh, living creatures exist in, in seawater coming into this, uh, to these evaporitic basins. So all of these have the potential to be preserved. We just needed to find a way to extract these fossils which were preserved from evaporites. And it's, it's not uh, straightforward, and this may justify the, um, the lack of studies throughout the, the last decades. Uh, regarding uh, evaporitic sediments. So there's a, there's a few um, uh, descriptions of the methods and interesting uh, results from evaporites, but I, I could only find a few dozens, if, if that much, uh, compared to maybe thousands of, of publications regarding uh, biostratigraphy of all ages. So oh, there's I can imagine. Really very, very little published uh, 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 work on, on, on salt biostratigraphy. If you narrow that down to uh, salt biostratigraphy applied to the uh, petroleum industry, then it's even less. Uh, I think I, I could find only what, something like less than 10 uh, publications regarding uh, um, salt biostratigraphy applied to the petroleum industry. So, oh, so wow. we're, we were, uh, well, uh, 
trying this at the lab, we tried several techniques. The normal techniques to extract um, uh, uh, polynomers, so polynology techniques, usually uh, use acids to basically to remove the um, mineral contents of uh, sedimentary rocks. That doesn't work with evaporite, so you need a, an adapted method to basically dissolve away uh, the evaporitic minerals, be it halite and hydrite or gypsum or whatever it's present, and to isolate the organic content. So it's, it requires an adapted method, and this may justify the, uh, why it hasn't been used so much. So basically, the, the recovery of, of these microfossils will depend on the original fossil contents. Of course, if they don't have fossils originally, I, I don't work miracles, so I cannot uh, extract them. But if they are present, then it's only a matter of the preparation method, the way you, you prepare the samples. If you know what you're doing and the, uh, have some information on the mineralogy of your samples, then you can adapt the methods to be able to separate the organic content and um, the mineral content. Once that's done, you just mount the, um, uh, the organic content on a slide and you can observe it under the microscope the same way you do with normal polynology samples. So it's not, it's not that complicated. It's also good because uh, the amount of sample that is required is not that much. It's a bit more than normal uh, sediments. So for example, if we have shale you may only need a few grams of sample if you're working with evaporites you'll need a bit more so around 100 grams depending on the, the on these impurities the contents uh, or the amount of, of these impurities in the evaporite sample so it's, it's exciting it's that um, you can use cuttings yes well it can be a challenge, especially uh, um, depending on the drill bit which is used so um, so uh, they can be basically washed away uh, when, when the mud logger is, is analyzing the samples. But if there's something left, then, then if there's enough sample, then it's, it, it's good enough to work with. So it's possible to work with cuttings. It's, that, that's a very good use. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, can, you can work with, with, of course, with outcrop samples, uh, core samples, and also with cuttings. And I'll show you some examples of what we've done. So we, we spent the last year or so um, uh, refining this technique uh, and initially it wasn't really working because we didn't really know how to tackle the, the, the samples because it was so different from everything else that we were used to, to process. But now we've refined the method and we have something like 90% success rate and that's pretty much the same success rate you have with normal samples. Uh, so non-evaporitic samples. So it's we're quite um, excited with with the with the potential use of this technique. So I'll I can show you some examples where this started and and what we've done. That would this, be great. This is a this is a salt mine in southern Portugal. Uh, it's an underground mine. So they they mine it for salt. Uh, most of the salt looks like this dirty halite that we see here which has these uh, pinkish, bluish, and, and grayish hues. And those are exactly the impurities we were looking for. In addition to that, there, were, there are some interbedded uh, sediments, so this dolomitic siltstone, some churty gypsum, and organic rich shale, and then you go back to dirty halides again. So all of these were samples. We got organic particles from all of them. The only one which was a bit more difficult to get anything relevant out of was this dolomitic siltstone. And this is probably because mm -hmm. it's been uh, either during deposition or during diagenesis, it was exposed to uh, oxidative conditions. And that's a killer for organic matter in general. So we could only find some uh, uh, oxidized and, and degraded organic particles that were not, not very relevant for uh, biostratigraphy. But all the other samples we were able to, to extract spores and pollen and also uh, phytoplasts, meaning little uh, plant uh, remains. And that's, that's basically another name for vitronite. So that was an add-on discovery, I would say, from, from this method that not only can extract uh, spores and pollen, and I'll show you also some marine uh, polynomorphs, but you can also measure vitronite reflectance and with that to obtain uh, Quantitative. That's amazing. Uh, that's a huge maturity. plus. Yeah. Yes, that's a huge plus. I think 
I think some companies will won't uh, be so much interested in the um, in the biostratigraphy, but actually the being able to measure the thermal maturity of, of the salt sequence is is actually a big big plus. So That's huge. Very, yeah, very important piece of information. I'd say in many basins around the world. So, so yeah, yeah, that's that's uh, that was one of the first finds. These these were probably the toughest samples that we processed <clears throat> because they are so varied and the mineralogies were so different. But we managed to extract organic particles from all of them. <clears throat> Great. I initially presented these results in one of the APG's uh, workshops in Europe. This was uh, last year in Poland. Uh, that that focused precisely on uh, on um, evaporites. During that uh, workshop, there was a field trip or a mine trip to the Vilitska salt mine, which is known for, it's actually not an active mine for, uh, for, for the ore, but it's now active only for touristic purposes. We were lucky enough to go around with, the, with a few uh, uh, Polish geologists that knew the mine quite well, so not just a touristic uh, um, tour. And I was able to sample also different types of, um, of evaporites and also the, these interbedded shales that, that occur. So the lithologies here are quite varied, the several types of salt and also the types of shales. And there's uh, active tectonics during uh, the deposition. So it's, it's actually quite a complex geology. So we sampled all the different types of, uh, uh, of lithologies. And in this case, all of the samples were productive. And we were able to find the pollen and spores, as we did before, and also some dinoflagellates, especially on the shale samples. So that means that this was under marine influence. You had episodic inflow of uh, seawater, and you had these dinoflagellates, which are That's very useful for, uh, for biostratigraphy, even more than, than pollen and spores. And again, we found uh, these phytoplasts, aka vitrinite, which again, can allow to determine uh, vitronite reflectance and with that the thermal maturity of the growth. This was also quite um, for us quite uh, uh, exciting because this, this was a completely different geological setting. This is a Miocene uh, salt, so quite different from the early Jurassic salt that we had examined before. So the, we're you know, uh, showing that the technique is applicable to uh, different types of settings, different ages. I'll just show one more example. Uh, this is a, from a salt mine. Uh, uh, examples were provided um, by a Moroccan colleague, which we uh, uh, are acknowledged to. And this, in this case, the, the age is quite similar to the one in, in Portugal, so it's early Jurassic. In this case, it's not mobile salt, so it's not, not a diapir. It's interbedded with uh, also several types of shales, and also the, the here the lithotypes varied quite a lot from uh, these shales, which were not that different from normal uh, shales that you would analyze for uh, polynology. But then pinkish halides, uh, more brown and black. Um, Does that so indicate a, yeah. a reducing environment? Does the pink um, indicate a reducing environment? Uh, well, actually, usually the opposite, at least with oh. non evaporitic uh, samples, we usually run away from these pinkish and, uh, and reddish colors, which usually mean oxidative uh, environments. Oh, okay. So that's so we, oh, just, but we decided to. Iron. The president, presence of iron, but that would make sense because that would be iron oxide instead of iron. Yes, sulfur. exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So that usually that red color is oxidized, the oxidized version of, of iron. Right, yeah. So we were a bit weary about these samples, but we decided to test them. And uh, voila, they, they also uh, provided spores and pollen and phytoclasts. So the, uh, the quality was not as good as the other types of samples, where it, these more brown, brownish and blackish samples, but they were also productive. So again, we were quite excited that even these uh, lithotypes that we didn't really expect to have much uh, results from, they're also productive. We can also extract uh, polynomorphs from, from these types of, of samples. So uh, again, different environments, uh, uh, different types of, of lithologies, but they were all uh, productive in different proportions. Some of them were quite good, others not that good. But that, that's 
also what you find with normal non evaporitic samples. Nice. So since, yeah, so we we're, were quite excited with this. It is uh, from the point that we managed to, to, to master the technique of, to process these samples, then the results have been very, very positive. Well, I'm so excited about this and yeah. glad that you'll be able to go into more detail when you're, you're doing, I guess, lunch and learns for the European uh, region and also yeah. a course. So this will be fantastic. Yes. I think it's so valuable. Yes, absolutely. So just to add that uh, since, since this, we've uh, tested two or three more uh, sites, uh, outcrops and also mine samples. That, that were also productive. So we tested one of uh, the Zechstein salt uh, from northern Poland, and we uh, also analyzed some gypsum samples from an outcropping dive here uh, from, uh, from Portugal. And again, they were, uh, we had positive results for in most of the samples. So we've, we've shown that it's possible to work with samples from Permian to Miocene age, different types of settings, uh, different types of uh, lithotypes, uh, so it, it, it does seem to work quite well. Uh, so we're, we're now, uh, I think that, as I was saying, I think the main challenge, and I thank APG to give me the opportunity to do, to do this, is just to make people aware that this is possible, this can provide very valuable results in uh, uh, facies that usually it's just a hazard to drill through, uh, but you can actually get uh, relevant information from, um, from this type of, uh, of samples. Oh, it's just amazing, and I'm thinking of all kinds of applications, not just in, in the, say, the um, Gulf Coast or some of the obvious places or in subsalt, but also in, in areas that are onshore where you have to drill through evaporites. It's, it's, I was thinking some Permian and some. It's so great. Yes. No, absolutely. If, if you look at the map of salt places around the world, I think there's only a few of them which are not petroleum provinces. So the salt, as you know, is, is a major element of, of uh, petroleum systems. And it's, uh, you know, as a seal, as a, a, a thermal uh, conductor, uh, so it plays such an important role. And I, I get the feeling that we don't know much about it in, in most of the basins. We have a oh. rough idea of the age because we can date the, the rocks below it and, and above it. But we usually don't we don't have any idea on the on the uh, thermal maturity of of the of the uh, of the, uh, of the salts, and we don't have no idea of of the, of the ages. Uh, oh, I totally agree. We usually just look at salt diapirs and think, okay, this is a structural influence, but not yeah. at all into the salt itself. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well. So yeah. This is great. Well, I want to thank you again. And again, this is um, an APG Science and Technology Showcase. And we've, our guest has been Gilles Majago. And we're happy that he will be get, presenting more in future events. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. And thank okay. you, Susan. Thank you.